Uh, thanks, uh, Park Launch Ali and the team for hosting this uh, panel. I think a much needed panel on the outlook for cryptos, macros, regulation, and the FTX fallout uh, on the entire industry. Um, with me, we've got an amazing uh, panel today uh, filled with a, a lot of uh, power stars. Uh, first is Hassan Ahmed. He's the head of Coinbase Southeast Asia. Uh, then we've got Shamil Malik, uh, founder and CEO of Haruko. And then we've got Abdul Rafay, co-founder and CFO of Zignili. Uh, I think a very relevant uh, panel uh, to give us insights on what's happening in the crypto industry. Um, what I'll do is I guess I'll start off uh, with uh, Hassan. And uh, Hassan, I'd like to kind of get a better understanding of what do you, how do you think the macro environment has played out for cryptos? I know in the crypto world, we'd like to get, uh, we'd like to think it's isolated. Uh, but as we've seen all too often, there's a 90% correlation between cryptos and the S&P 500. And then that obviously implies that interest rates have a significant impact on the movement uh, of the entire market. So uh, how do you think that's played out in a rate, uh, increasing rates environment? And what is the outlook going forward? Yeah, uh, thanks. <clears throat> and uh, uh, thank you for everyone for joining. Uh, good to kind of have the Pop Punch crew back together again. So um, it's funny, actually, last uh, this time last year, we had done a, a panel on, on crypto as well, if uh, some of you remember, and the, the sentiment and the discussion at that time was, uh, you know, as different as it gets. So um, the, the, uh, the kind of the big picture side for, for crypto, um, as you're sort of pointing out, Pesel, like, I think that the, uh, the, the kind of reality is that, you know, crypto is looked as like a sort of very risk on asset class. Um, and I think that's sort of how it's been treated historically and, and sort of, you know, for, for good reason uh, on many levels. And now with the, the kind of general macro cycle and the tech cycle sort of going through this very kind of extreme reset, um, I think crypto has, you know, been along for the ride on it. Um, and I, I, you know, the, the, the way sort of the correlation kind of generally works out is it, a lot of it is sort of underpinned uh, with the expectation that there, this is sort of part of this kind of, you know, far out um, asset class that has like um, dividends or sort of returns that are like far out in the future as like the use cases and the value, uh, the, the kind of utility aspect of it grows into its valuation. And so as interest rates uh, go up, anything that's sort of further out on that curve basically kind of, you know, sees the most extreme sort of uh, uh, effect of it. And that, that gets reflected in like the, the kind of high growth uh, tech sector as well. So, you know, if you look at the big names, like Shopify and, and, you know, ones that were just kind of very dominant not too long ago, Every, everything's gone through that like 60 to 80% reset uh, at this point. Uh, and it looks like, it, you know, for uh, all practical purposes right now, like it looks like it's sort of continuing as well. So I think that the, the kind of valuation resets are very well sort of in very much in play. It's sort of in full force and sort of this gravity is kind of acting down across sort of the whole spectrum. Uh, we can get into more of like at a fundamental, uh, you know, uh, level, like what is sort of happening more on the kind of builder and technology side, but at least from a valuation and kind of financial cycle, like we're pretty much sort of, you know, getting towards kind of the, the trough side of things. Um, can also talk more about like how this compares to kind of previous cycles, uh, but maybe I'll just pause there. Yep. And, and yeah, and I'm glad you brought up uh, previous cycles because I think, I think for everyone, across the board, the cycle has changed, even for the equities market. I think specifically for crypto, it's uh, what the expectations were. Um, it literally like topped out once the Fed gave forward guidance in October. And if you tack out that double top back in October, November was linked to that. Um, Sharmil, I'd uh, love to get, first of all, uh, tell us a little bit more about Haruko and then also you know, the thoughts, your thoughts on what's happening and what you're seeing in, in, uh, over at your space. Sure, thank you very much. Uh, Faisal, nice to connect with the Park Launch guys. This is the, it's the first time I'm, I'm doing one of these panels. It's great to see so much participation. So, you know, it's great. Thank you, everyone. Um, Haruko is a technology provider. We provide technology to uh, hedge funds and asset managers, basically anyone who's deploying capital, institutional capital to, uh, you know, the digital space or the digital assets ecosystem. Uh, we provide a portfolio management, risk management solution. We provide data both in CFI and DeFi. Um, you know, the, the technology was built by us, uh, and it's uh, you know we were power users of this. We ran a hedge fund for about four years, a crypto native hedge fund in this space. Um, we continue to invest uh, 
on the venture side also. So we're very close to the technology to the technology stack, um, both on chain and uh, on centralized exchanges. I think um, you know crypto as any other asset class or any other new technology benefited massively from uh, the low rates environment and uh, the quantitative easing that you guys have already alluded to. Uh, I think it's also uh, quite quite important to um, you know just put this into context um, because the way to think about it is that um, Bitcoin, if you think about Bitcoin or you know uh, cryptography or or uh, operating systems or uh, you know, of, or game theory, which is essentially what the intersection is, um, is, is a very powerful concept, but um, it also has a token attached to it. And the token is traded on an ongoing basis. So everyone is free, free to speculate on that. And, um, you know, generally you'd have the believers uh, who've, you know, over the last six, seven, eight, nine, ten years have believed and all, you know, obviously one of them, one of them, uh, and that belief is manifested in their trading. Um, and, and those who don't believe their, man, their belief is manifested in their trading. And so there's no natural anchor point for this as a trading asset class. And what ends up happening is that we benchmark the success of crypto to the price of Bitcoin or the price of altcoins. Uh, so I think it's very, you know, we need to put that into context. It's like, imagine if the internet was al also had a token, it would be as volatile as Bitcoin. It would even probably be more volatile as, <laughs> as Bitcoin. So I think it's very important to just highlight that and focus more on uh, the technology of it, the regulation of it, which, which I, I guess is the, is the point of this forum. The other thing I would add is, um, you know, Bitcoin has, has a real story to tell. Um, you know, it, it, it solves many issues, even though people think there was a utility of it and so on. We can get into that later if we want to. But I think it's important to highlight that it's actually a technology infrastructure. And, you know, a lot of people think that uh, going down the, uh, uh, the credit spectrum and going to altcoins is a better idea. I think it's also, you know, we should highlight that an altcoin is just like a startup that's gone public. Right. Exactly. So, 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 you know, investing in a startup that's gone public uh, comes with its own risk. So the fact that a startup goes bust uh, and because of that, an altcoin goes from $10 to zero doesn't mean that crypto doesn't work because, you know, you've got 5,000 tokens and the first token of that is Bitcoin. But it's important to just understand that Bitcoin is not like the 5,000th token. There is real technology, there is real solution, there is a real need for that infrastructure. And so it's important to highlight that. But I think overall what I'm seeing uh, by talking to institutional investors, uh, people have taken a bit of a pause just because they want to evaluate what just happened. Uh, and we'll obviously talk about that and I'll, you know, I'll happily talk about the regulation of it and so on. But there's enough capital out there that is still interested and is still uh, looking for the right opportunities, uh, people who are building interesting stuff are still going to get a lot of traction. So, you know, I'm not worried about the long-term uh, future of uh, this space at all. Great. And some great points uh, that you pointed out. I think it's always important when we're looking at this asset class to understand what it actually is. It's actually money and a network and it's startups, operating systems, everything all in one. So people tend to conflate the entire ecosystem on one bad actor and effectively kind of write it off. But I would say this is, we're, we're in the 2000 era or 1998, 2000 era of the, of the internet uh, when it comes to crypto. So it would be like writing off the internet on pets.com or thingamajib.com effectively, right? So there was a lot of exuberance back then. Um, coming uh, over to, over to Rafi, uh, Rafi and I have been peers in multiple startups. So we've had lots of discussions on, I think we talked less about the companies we were invested in and more yeah. <laughs> about so, more on the cryptos. Oh, so we've speculated on what would have happened. Um, given, you know, given what you're doing, I mean, Zignally is effectively, I call it the trillion of the chat era where you're effectively creating a centralized, uh, trading mechanism. So can, can you tell us a little bit more about, um, your platform, and then also I'd love to get your take on what you're seeing in terms of actual transaction data and interest level sure. uh, macro perspective. Thanks, Faisal. So yeah, I think the first of all, Signaly is a social trading platform. Um, it basically connects the fund managers with the investors. We have been around for last three, four years, uh, have done pretty well. In fact, this bearish market actually helps us out 
uh, people can make money and anyone can make money in bullish market, but it gets tougher in the bearish market. So then they realize they need, need kind of a sophisticated management. So that that's helpful for the business. Coming on to the uh, micro environment, I think uh, uh, um, both Hassan and Shaman made excellent points on this that um, the environment is, yes, at the top, there is a, a micro synergy between what's happening at the, in the conventional markets, patriots and everything with the cryptocurrencies. It, it's a wild notion for the last few years that people think that, you know, uh, cryptos are something different financially. It can decouple and all that. Yes, at times that can happen. But when you look at the data, they are highly correlated. In fact, um, for the worst, in last one month, it has decoupled on the opposite side. You know, the financial markets, uh, conventional markets, if you look, they have done pretty well in November and uh, they have started strongly in December, while cryptocurrencies have not done really well, thanks to the uh, FTX saga that, it, that has happened. And, I mean, I call it a mini black swan event for, for our industry. Um, it has like, you know, if everything was going normal, November would have taken Bitcoin to maybe 24,000, you know, just like in line with what other markets have been doing how the dollar index has come down and everything, you know. But again, if you look at the, from, if you compare 2017-18 with now, there is a big difference. The difference is liquidity and the institutions in the market. At that time, when the falls were happening, there were literally, there were no floors at all. And the problem was there was no infrastructure either. I remember the time when there was Kraken only and executing a transaction of a simple buy or sell on Kraken used to take like three tries and five minutes, you know. So that's ridiculous. Binance was very new at that time. And um, honestly speaking, since I am based out of Pakistan, so I've never used Coinbase. Uh, but um, other than that, it was difficult, you know, not the case anymore. You still find liquidity. Retail still finds liquidity. I'm not talking about the particular coins which went, you know, burst because of some scam or anything. But broadly speaking, I think situation is much better than what it was back in the day. And now, even with all the all the um, uh, interest rate hikes and everything, it's literally pretty amazing that Bitcoin is still hovering around 16, 17, in fact, 17,000 uh, as of today. Uh, in previous times, it would have gone down to like 5,000, 8,000 already, or at least would have shown a large wig on some place like BitMEX or something, you know? So just like as a, from a broader perspective, I think, um, not sure if we have hit the bottom yet overall, but I think from the interest perspective, there's a lot of money out there ready to be deployed both in terms of uh, secondary market as well as the investment. VCs are pretty upbeat, but I mean, you know, like they, they are thinking that sometime maybe Q2, Q3 next year, they can properly start deploying again. So yeah, that's what I'm thinking. No, great. Yeah, it's, uh, look, with, with Bitcoin, I think it's one thing that we're certain on is the market calls for a million dollar Bitcoin when it's in a bull market. And when it's in a bear market, they call for a thousand dollar Bitcoin, right? Yeah, so, always. We, before I'm, I'm actually, I'm, I'm impressed how surprisingly strong it's held, and I'm, I'm in the camp that maybe the bottom is not in, but we're fairly close to it. Um, but at the same time, uh, you know, it's like when you look at the historical cycles, when if the markets had come down, you know, by fifty, if you look at Nasdaq, fifty percent effectively, then you would have seen ninety-five to ninety-eight percent correction in Bitcoin, and that hasn't happened, right? So that's showing goes to your point, and that's why I was more curious to hear what you guys are seeing, because it seems like this buoyancy and liquidity is still there um, versus previous cycles. Um, mo moving on to regulation, um, I mean, one of one of the uh, Coinbase Hassan, uh, you know, when I was first got into the crypto space back in two thousand sixteen seventeen. Um, I remember I was researching and Coinbase was among the few trusted, it was primarily by a cap table, the, the type of investors that came in, but effectively it's considered to be among the most regulated exchanges out there. And that's allowed you guys to basically go through multiple cycles and multiple other, uh, every cycle there's an implosion here and there in exchange. Um, so I wanted to speak more on regulation where I personally think regulation is healthy if we do want institutional investors to come in. We cannot have, I mean, effectively, a lot of these tokens that are being created out of thin air are behaving like central banks, their own central banks, and creating money out of thin air and uh, creating hypothecation, rehypothecation. So what my what my concern is if we don't regulate uh, this market, you're going to see, continue to see individuals enter and institutionals will never get comfort, nor will their uh, investors. And so it will always be a sideline asset class. Uh, which to me, to me, I look at crypto as that allocation that would have gone into gold and silver in terms of the ETFs when times are stressful. 
And then eventually it obviously becomes a primary uh, dominant uh, asset class in the digital cashless environment. So from your point of view, where do you see regulation? It looks like the SEC is talking heavily about it. Um, now there's more and more sounds on it, but there seems to be a battle between the CFTC versus the SEC in terms of commodity versus security. I think we could make an argument for uh, Ethereum and some of the other tokens being the security, depending on how the ICO happen versus Bitcoin that, uh, that, that have a proof of work um, and, and things like Bitcoin. So kind of give me your take from that angle. Where do you, where do you see regulation? Is that going to be good or bad? In the, might be bad in the short term and then good in the long term. So I'd love to get that take. And then I'd love to hear from each of you on your, your bit on regulation. Yeah, sure. So, uh, you know, with, with Coinbase, um, as you mentioned, I mean, its sort of roots are in Silicon Valley and it's a, it's a U.S. first exchange. Now it's, you know, fairly global in its footprint, but uh, much of the kind of DNA and like the stance that it adopted from its early days was, I think a lot of it was driven off, you know, from being kind of a, in a U.S. Um, sort of, you know, centric uh, place. But but the ethos is really gonna you know to be the most trusted and easiest to use and and the, the kind of principles that we try to go by are to you know um, comply with all applicable laws and regulations. Now there, there are times where you know because it's a new asset class because it's complex um, we do find like that even regulators have a hard time getting their arms around it and and sometimes the regulation itself or the proposed regulation can be sort of misguided uh, or, or be well-intentioned, but not like really achieving the policy goals it's intending to set out for. So we do engage a lot in a lot of policy um, and advocacy work as well to try to make sure that, um, you know, we're, we're, we're representing sort of the industry in the right way. And we also see across many different jurisdictions uh, because of our footprint. Uh, so we're talking to regulators really all across the world at this point from the US, uh, you know, EU, UK, Singapore, um, Australia, Japan, and so on. So, um, yeah, the, it's a, regulation is, is a big topic, and it's also important to just sort of decompose maybe some of the, the different kind of components or like the, the pillars of, of regulation. Um, so the way that I, I think about it is, is actually there's quite a, a few different kind of meaty topics, you know, under this um, um, regulation umbrella. So. A lot of the, the, I'd say even the first like eight to 10 years uh, was really just focused on AML, on like stopping illicit finance, you know, things around like sanctions compliance, um, you know, all the, the CTF type of stuff. Um, and now what we're seeing is the, 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 the new kind of topic uh, of, of the day and, and, you know, for good reason is now around like user and consumer protection and investor protection. And, you know, we'll, we'll you know, go into this more when we talk about like um, FTX, but in general, like, you know, as crypto adoption has increased. Uh, this has become more and more top of mind for regulators for thinking about uh, centralized entities that are servicing this industry. How do we make sure that there's enough kind of robustness and separation and controls to, to make sure that these uh, regulated entities are doing what they're supposed to be doing? One kind of interesting kind of, you know, close to home for me example of that is even within Singapore, you know, the MAS has a regulatory framework um, and, and actually kind of FTX had a subsidiary in uh, in Singapore that was sort of uh, wiped out and as part of these bankruptcy proceedings. So even the MAS, which is the Monetary Authority of Singapore, had to put out a statement saying that, hey, our regulatory framework really was about like AML. There was nothing in, in the framework that addressed anything around like consumer protection or like investor protections. We are now like, you know, working towards that. So, so this is really kind of a, a wake up call for, for regulators everywhere to think about, um, you know, what is that next wave going to be? Uh, while preserving uh, concepts around like retail and consumer access to this asset class without, um, but, but protecting them at the same time. There's other concepts around, you know, market integrity, um, things to do with like tax compliance as well. Those are also uh, important, but I, I feel like those are probably going to be a little further along. Uh, but I think AML and, and consumer protection is, is sort of the, the new thing at the moment. Sure, I guess, um, you know, Hassan, yeah. Hassan made some great points there, and I agree with uh, pretty much all of them because, you know, they're, uh, uh, they're basically all logical and rational. And so, yeah, I agree with that. I think, I think it's also important to just um, take a step back and think about what we've just seen over the last eight months. You know, there is a need for regulation, 100%. But what, what actually transpired, you know, what happened in Celsius? Um, it wasn't a crypto issue at all. It was just bad asset liability mismatch, mismanagement. 
in finance, we've been dealing with this for a number of decades, right? So you want to make sure that your assets and liabilities are matched so that when the liability guys come to the door to ask for their money back, it's not tied up in something where you can't take it out and you've got no liquidity. Similarly, 3AC. 3AC, again, was a mandate issue. Uh, they're a hedge fund that needs to be, you know, hedge funds by by way of their mandate needs to need to be in liquid strategies. If hedge funds start masquerading as venture capital, you've got you've got funds that are supposed to be more liquid on a monthly, quarterly basis tied up for years. Again, a massive issue. Got nothing to do with crypto. Then yeah. we come to then we come to FTX. You know, um, you know, uh, Rafe said that it's a black swan, and I agree. It's a it's a black swan from the perspective that it's a huge event. But I think um, you know there are people who'd say that it's similar to what happened with Lehman. But I think it's actually a combination of both Lehman and Enron. So it's it's like Lehman because there was leverage upon leverage. So you know, think CDO Square for guys who were in structuring or secu securitization. Think uh, uh, you know a portfolio of credit to be ranked or, or to be rated. AAA by the by the agencies similar to that FTT was being um, you know relevered at Al, uh, Alameda and back to FTX so leverage upon leverage like Lehman but then there was just old fashioned fraud you know uh, client money laws have been there for for years uh, you've had retail brokers take uh, uh, customer uh, deposits and use them and they're they're regulated and they're not allowed to do that so there's nothing new there you know it's not like crypto needs to be regulated because crypto is very different you know i think it's important for us to highlight that crypto as an asset class is different because it's digital and it exhibits some some qualities of of a physical asset class right it's uh, you know it's a better asset and it's scarce you know unlike other digital assets so it requires some special things um, and then you need to separate out how c5 works to DeFi. so you know the regulator will say oh we need to regulate crypto it could mean many different things one of the things could be we need to ban it because it's as as hassan said it needs aml and so on but i think it's important to highlight it's important to just distinguish between c5 and d5 because one involves central counterparties wherever you have central counterparties who have asymmetric information and can use that against their users or to their benefit versus their users they need to be regulated same as in traditional finance. So if you think about the FX market, it's a $5 trillion a day market, which is unregulated. You know, so a lot of people will know this, that FX market, which is the largest market in the world, largest financial market in the world, is unregulated. However, the interaction between centralized bodies and its entities that it deals with, that bit is regulated. Similarly, FTX, I mean, there should be line of sight into balance sheet of FTX. Why wouldn't you have line of sight into FTX's balance sheet? FTX was supposedly the most pristine you know, closest to DC, funding Democrats and Republicans the same, the, uh, you know, the crystal clear uh, uh, firm, that's the one that's gone belly up. So I, I think, you know, we need to figure out and the regulator needs help. And as it's been very common in this industry, there needs to be a very collaborative approach to help the regulator get comfortable with the asset class and highlight to the regulator that you don't need to solve or even understand all the problems before you address the easy ones. The easy ones are anyone who's handling client money needs to be regulated. There needs to be line of sight on the, I mean, you know, it's surprising that if you look at the cap, if you look at the cap table of FTX or, you know, most of these guys, even, even Celsius, I mean, Celsius had some of the most conservative investors in their cap table. So the fact that they missed it is, is actually something more to think about than the fact that, uh, you know, someone was able to just run away with money. Um, you know, I'm sure I can say more, but, uh, you know, I, I want to just not monopolize everyone's time and you know, Rafa, you should. Yeah, no, I think a very nice, very nice summary by both of you, but I'll just add one thing. I mean, the regulator, I mean, as a, as a community, as a, as a, as a crypto community, we need to understand this very, very clearly that all regulations are not bad. Basically we have this thing, you know, like we, I feel that the community still try to act like a in a cowboyish manner, you know, which is not healthy because it's, it's, it's not a competition that, you know, yeah, it, it was good back in 2016, 17 as a narrative to bring FOMO and the other people, I think, just to say that, you know, Bitcoin will kill the banking system and all. I mean, there is a, there is, there is a world, there is a pretty much possible world where everything can coexist and everything should coexist, right? So regulation is not bad. Governance is not bad. I think that right now, the problems that we are seeing right now is lack of governance, which is coming out of the fact that there is no regulation. Governance is also a function of regulation, right? Like 
if 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 there is certain factor which is forcing banks to keep a certain capital right that's where governance is based on if you look at the same set of investors who have put money into crypto startups versus the conventional startups are they keeping the same ongoing due diligence on them answer is no they are not concerned about much about the crypto startups maybe because no one cares like no one is asking them the question or no one is asking no one is putting an eventual liability back on the founder or the business that did you comply with this regulation or not like if you look at a bank or a startup or a cryptocurrency company the cryptocurrency company or a crypto company would come up come off as a most liberal in terms of that and i think as shamil, shamil said if someone is handling the money and billions of dollars then there has to be an oversight you know you cannot just run away defi again like is a way which eventually regulator will come up for it uh, if 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 these things continuously have happen because regulators job i mean yeah they they might be doing other things but i think on the top of it they want to uh, you know protect consumers eventually you know and have some discipline so if these things keep happening just like celsius or whatever or three three ac or ftx or whatever you know and that there are many other things happening as well this is not healthy you know you you need to have an oversight if you don't have that oversight to a certain extent especially in the centralized bodies where the monies are being handled we will never attract the serious investors eventually and this 1 trillion dollar market cap market will 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 never become the the fx kind of a trading market where every can at, everyone can at least be comfortable around you know that our money is safe and you know eventually end of the day we can touch it that's the that's the perspective on regulation yeah no and, and that that's you guys bring up something very interesting i mean even as venture capital fund managers the second you're managing more than two people's money the regulation is so intense that i yeah. it's just really mind boggling to me how these type of events can take place in this day and age and we're not talking about like somebody handling like a million 2 million dollars we're talking about people handling billions of dollars right so it's really it's amazing that this is happening this day and age but when you when we you know going to the point on what took place with lehman and the bear and and the whole management of risk back then and even when i go back to the dot com bubble i mean to me i like in a lot of what's happening in, in it's a combination of what happened during the dot com bubble combined with what happened in 2008 and effectively it's like a whole new environment that we've created but it seems like we haven't learned much from it and then every time regulation does come in it tends to have an overreach and then basically again it's watered down right so i agree in that sense so so uh, guys and this I'll, I'll leave this question to everyone um, let's talk a little bit more about specifically ftx because i think that's two two projects i want to talk about in specific because it's wiped out a lot of capital it scared a lot of the new investors that came in shamil i think you were mentioning this earlier and and i agree with you every time i'm trying to explain a digital assets to any friend of mine i'm always talking about bitcoin and sometimes ethereum and and then when they go and invest you know i got so many messages like oh i ended up buying luna and they lost all their money and just because they, everybody thinks that you know that's going to be the next one that's going to go to $50,000 even if the circulating supply is 50 billion um you know but my my i guess my concern in this um uh, in the entire equation for cryptos going forward is that how how do we restore confidence uh, specifically what happened in in luna what happened in ftx and the the number of people that have lost money i think that this is going to create a slightly longer bear market potentially than we've seen historically so i'd love to get your take on luna and ftx respectively uh, from each of you so sure. yeah as in you yeah, want uh sorry shamil did you want to go first go ahead no no i'm i'm, I'm actually have to wait no problem okay so so i actually i want to build back on on what shamil and, and rafa were saying earlier and i think one of the the things that's really important to kind of call out is like this difference between regulations and just governance and just this notion of controls because corporate malfeasance is is actually very hard to pick up um but if you're just kind of talking about like plain vanilla regulation and just compliance because that that is trying to basically solve for a very kind of different objective so in the case of ftx you know where where a lot of the sort of the fraud aspects um that happen and and they happen in in financial institutions and you know there are kinds of entities all the time too so it's not that it's again like just unique to crypto but with with with, with the uh, with ftx like the now that we're kind of peeling back the onion i mean it's it's 
shocking, right? Like <laughs> how little uh, of any kind of controls there were. And it was just the, the same, the age old story of people were just kind of, you know, uh, social signaling, the media was bought out, like they were just filing in because the other kind of high, high name investors, uh, you know, high profile investors had come in in the first place. But not having like, you know, appropriate boards, not having independent uh, directors, not having any kind of real board representation, you know, by uh, representing the interests of the investors, not having any um, internal audits, like, you know, three lines of defense kind of models, external audits by reputable auditors, like all of this stuff, like, it, you know, th this is sort of, again, like, uh, you know, related to, but different from, from regulatory concepts. And I think the, the, it, it behooves kind of the, the investor community and, and VCs uh, and, and others to, you know, rebalance this, this, I think, equation that's gone a little too far uh, out of whack. Uh, and, and, you know, ask for like real governance, especially like as the numbers start getting much more and more material, and especially if there's fine uh, money's at risk. So, so I, I, I'm, I'm hopeful that, um, you know, it feels like sometimes like we, we don't really learn our lessons, but I, I'm hopeful that we will take some, something away from this. Um, and, and, you know, this kind of, this kind of pressure uh, and real expectations are going to come back into conversations and diligence is going to uh, become a real thing again. So, so I think on the side of FTX, like that's something that I, I think is really important to kind of keep in mind. Uh, you know, even things like the, the proof of reserves debate that's going on right now, it, it, I think it's a good start. But again, like it's hard to know what assets are really encumbered if you're just even like publishing things on chain. So it, it will require kind of, you know, the, the kind of wet signatures and like real world interventions to make sure that you know, liabilities and, and assets are, are truly matched um, sort of in the way that like it's sort of done for other asset classes as well. I think the, the Luna thing, um, I, I have a bit of a controversial take on it, but uh, honestly, like, I feel like this was one where it was really pretty much just specced into the protocol. And so folks that kind of read it for what it was and didn't follow the herd saw the reflexivity of it and kind of knew it was coming and many called it out as well. And some had extremely successful successful shorts off of it. Um, I think that was just sort of a, a confidence game more again, like between the, the community and, and folks just wanting to, to follow what everyone else was doing into these kind of, you know, unsustainable APRs. But I, I think it's starkly different from what like FTX represents, which was this very kind of clean on, you know, on-chain uh, representation. And it did exactly what it said it was gonna do, uh, to be honest. There wasn't really gonna any malfeasance over there. Yeah. I think I would, I would, um, you know, absolutely agree with uh, uh, with Hassan on that, and um, you know, Luna in particular, and we can, you know, go deeper into that if we want to, was uh, was by design, um, unfortunately, something that was flawed, and the reason why it was flawed by design was not because, like you, like Hassan said, that it wasn't because someone was trying to uh, con anyone out of their money, it was just because it's a new asset class and a new ecosystem and a new technology stack and and you know just uh, you know a, a new thing w w and uh, you make a mistake and you don't know what's happening however i would say going back to uh, you know putting luna at as a context and then going back and thinking about the market as such the 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 strongest uh, signal or the strongest thing in in a market which is developing is uh, its bullish sentiment so, you know, whether it's a large VC or uh, a small VC or a family office, uh, you know, it doesn't matter how corporately, co corporate sound, you know, corporate, from corporate perspective, you're sound, um, everyone gets bought in. So FOMO is not just for retail uh, investors. FOMO is something that goes all across uh, uh, the, the ecosystem. So, uh, you know, Ontario teachers uh, investing in Celsius is not because they didn't do their due diligence. It's just that it's just because they didn't want to miss out on the next two x or three x of that. So people actually put, um, you know, people's life savings or pension money or you know the most conservative investors investors came in to FTX at a thirty two billion dollar valuation. So to think that a thirty two billion dollar company, um, you know, on paper a thirty two billion dollar company didn't have independent inve independent uh, directors or uh, uh, you know the three lines of defense that Hassan mentions, or uh, you know corporate governance is is just mind-boggling. This is not something that started a couple of years ago. This has been going on for you know decades, and people in, have been investing in institutional capital. So I think it's important to remember that um, you know the, the bullish sentiment and the underlying strength of uh, um, you know the positiveness that was in the market sort of dwarfs the difference between amazing companies 
and really bad companies. And, and so, you know, you this happens at every level, right? So, so the guy who sees Bitcoin at sixty thousand dollars is like, oh my god, how could I miss this? What's the next Bitcoin? And it goes into Ripple or goes into Luna or goes into something or the other because they think this is going. But the reason why BTC was a sixty thousand was because of how sound the story behind BTC is. Now, so so that's that's sort of the, the general uh, uh, framework that you know we at least I think about when I think about these things. Now, going back to FTX, in addition to what uh, um, you know what was mentioned before, um, I think it's very important to also highlight that. Um, so we traded on FTX. So you know we were a large market maker slash trader on FTX, and even when FTX was not the biggest exchange or not the you know most uh, institutionalized quote unquote institutionalized exchange, we saw as an institutional participant on these exchanges, we saw differences between a Binance and an FTX. Even though the entire world would say or the media would say that Binance is the one that's less institutional, the reality was completely opposite. Because as an institutional investor who's trading in the market, you want to make sure that you go to an exchange that has the least amount of market impact. You're able to get your orders done for the least amount of spread. So, you know, more liquidity uh, gets you more liquidity and so on. They were always that. And on FTX, we saw some things that we were used to seeing very early on, about 20 years ago in the FX equities markets, then got ended in those markets as more regulation came out. So you couldn't front run, for example, you couldn't take a large bid and lift the offers, you couldn't take a large offer and hit the bids and so on. These were issues that we saw firsthand on some of these exchanges, which were supposedly more institutional. So I think um, it's also important to appreciate that, um, you know, the more money comes in, the more you're able to market yourself and the more you're able to suggest to other people that you're, uh, you know, more pristine than, than the guys around you. Um, you know, from an a a Alameda standpoint, there was, um, you know, how can you have, how can you own an exchange and be the main market maker for that exchange? And this story, by the way, is not a new story. If you remember a company called FXCM, they were very close to FX Capital, right, which was the inherent market maker for FXCM. This happened about a decade ago, or maybe even eight or nine years ago. So this, this is not like something happened 100 years ago and we've forgotten about it. This was there. And then Lucadia had a massive uh, uh, bailout of FXCM and got a great deal. I think just here, there's another point to make that what's surprising and very positive that BTC is still a 17,000 versus not at 10,000 is the fact that crypto survives without the Fed put and without uh, you know, taxpayers' money. So no, no one's come out to bail any of these companies out. They've, you know, from a free market perspective, they've actually had to fight it out themselves and they're there to be taken, right? And, and crypto still survives. So I think that is, that's even more positive for me than everything that we've discussed. I know. Uh, no, it's I, amazing. I, I definitely, I definitely touched upon Luna, and I definitely touched upon FTX. But you know, happy for Rafe to add. Sure. So uh, two things I would completely agree. Luna was by design, and FTX was by intent. I think the two different things. Um, and the second part about the Binance versus FTX. So a very interesting short story. So we are um, on our project. We are one of the largest brokers of Binance. Uh, you know, API brokers. So. Three years back when we were integrating, we had an option to either go with FTX or Binance. We started looking in the book then, I mean, exactly what you're saying, there was, there was an issue. And I'm, even on my personal Twitter, I, I flagged it out for last one and a half year, tagged the people as well. Some people blocked me, even deleted me from their Telegram groups. But we identified this problem that, you know, if there was this glitch in the screen as soon as you put a bid or an offer, a slight glitch and that's it. You know, you know what I'm talking about, right? So, so that, that was there. Um, you don't find these things on Binance. So that I also completely agree regarding the uh, situation and, and how the confidence would come back. I think the answer is the persistence of this, is this crypto sphere. If you look at the FUD and all the problems in 2017, 18, there was this common thing, right? Twice a month, there used to be China ban, right? You see, you see market and there used to be a tweet from some random Chinese outlet that China is going to ban crypto and then boom. And then the next one would be Korea is banning and then boom. So I think we, we came out of it pretty much, I think, in a, in a good shape. 
of this China brand thing. And now I think uh, this is the time for the industry to, to you know, maybe build, keep building more, um, but focus more on transparency. I think, I think it is now very much a responsibility of the large centralized institutions, uh, be it Binance or even Coinbase or Gemini or all the large players, you know, to be more transparent. I don't know how would that be done. I'm sure they must be thinking about it, but I think the confidence is pretty much shattered, you know, not only the people from outside, but people from inside as well, you know, like, for example, for us, custodian is Binance, right? So even when Binance is, is visibly trying to make some effort, even if it's like a powerful measure, but our customers are coming and asking us, okay, something happens to you, what would, what, where would we go? Even if Binance has custody, that's a very genuine question. No one asked us in the last three years, but they're now asking. And, you know, we are seeing a definite people crawling back their, 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 their capital, not doing anything, just keeping in their wallets, you know. But this is like the this is like the sign of people showing a lack of trust, more transparency, more instruments around it. And I think I think there's a high time of high time that that, you know, um, someone comes up with this, this kind of an infrastructure play where the transfer, where this kind of these kind of things can be more visible. Again, I don't know how would that look like, but I think in next 12 months, any step towards being more uh, governed and transparent will bring back the internal and external investors' confidence back in the industry. Otherwise, it will become very, very difficult for the industry to come back to, you know, like full Z. Yeah, no. just, uh, uh, sorry, just quickly add, add two things to that. So, so I, I agree, and I think Vitalik had actually a really uh, good working paper that he published a couple of weeks yes. ago. So yes, yes. There's a lot of excitement in the community about that, and I think it's about like proof reserves of the asset side, and then he's talking about like applying uh, zero knowledge proofs and mercuries for the liability side. So I, I'm actually quite optimistic, like that within a year we're probably going to see like a working prototype of that um, that's going to start getting picked up in in addition to POR, which basically solves for proof of solvency. Um, so so yeah. we'd love to kind of see more of that happening, and for consumers and institutions start demanding that as well. I think the other quick thing I wanted to say, uh, Faisal, to you is that. It's interesting that uh, these big institutions that are allocating capital um, basically chose counterparty risk over technology risk, right? Like Ontario Teachers, Tamasek, they all said, look, we're going to invest in equities of these kind of, you know, service providers. Um, and they chose, uh, you know, Celsius and, and all that. Um, but I, I hope it leads to different conversations of these institutions saying, hey, actually, maybe betting on the, the, the kind of actual, you know, uh, blockchains and uh, tokens directly and direct exposure, given that it's so battle tested, um, is actually a better risk reward. Um, so that would be pretty cool to see uh, as an outcome out of this. It's it, it, when I was doing the LPA for my fund, I wanted to do ten percent opportunistic allocation to crypto, um, but I was very blunt about it that that's going to be only Bitcoin and Ethereum. And a lot of the investors pushed back, saying, "Why wouldn't you invest in the actual crypto, like company out, companies out there and other tokens?" I'm like, because I'm going into it's already a risky asset class given venture capital in Pakistan. And then on, on top of that, I'm going to another risky asset class. So why would you tech, go after the battle hardened uh, stuff that I still think has a significant upside? I mean, we're not looking at like a 2x from here. It's still a pretty big upside if you have a long term uh, view on this stuff. So agreed 100%. Uh, guys, so I think we should probably turn to some questions. We've got a lot of questions out here. Um, I keep, Shamil, I think this has been a lot of interest in. Um, in what you were saying, it's, uh, there's there's a question. Given the Shamo's comment of crypto being a core technology, are any of you seeing a trend towards the technology being utilized by incumbent companies to graduate their infrastructure? That is, instead of uh, us having Web 3.0, we are really going towards Web 2.5, allowing the next billion users uh, to be onboarded to crypto without the Web 3.0 complexities. Uh, would would love to get your response on that. Sure. So I think, um, you know, there is a lot of uh, interest and, in, you know, um, more than just uh, uh, Bitcoin, as you would expect, or, or any crypto from that perspective, people are looking at uh, builders and people who are building picks and shovels, uh, which is the which is the cliche. Um, you know, it still remains to be seen exactly how, um, you know, you would decentralize everything and, you um, you know, just build a Web 3.0 or a Web 2.5. I think Web 2.5 is definitely something which is which we're seeing more and more interest in from the perspective that um, you know build stuff for the metaverse, you know, stuff that's already been built, 
um, in in e-commerce, how you can actually take that e-commerce for the metaverse. So, so there's a lot of interest in, you know, we've seen investors go into um, how retail and, and retail providers can benefit from that. So that there's a lot of interest uh, from that, you know, in, in that perspective. There's obviously a lot of interest in building fintech like uh, um, like solutions or trading services or risk management solutions on how you can manage the risk both on CFI and DeFi, which is essentially the space that uh, you know Haruko covers uh, to some extent. Um, I think you know just just going back into this, I think it's also important to just highlight that as as crypto has become bigger and bigger, there was a lot of emphasis on custody and trading because that's how you get into a position. So, you know, all the technology we saw, whether it's five blocks or copper or anchorage, was either on custody or from a Talos perspective or a coin rouge perspective on how you integrate from an execution point of view. So there is now more and more uh, uh, emphasis on transparency, and I completely agree with Hassan uh, that transparency in this space is is what is important. And transparency generally comes from more information. So data providers, we're seeing a lot of interest in data provision, both on chain and on on a centralized basis. So you know whether it's a uh, retail or institutional adoption, um, you know just getting more data and more information. Uh, anyone who's providing that kind of service, we're seeing a lot of interest in. I'll, uh, there's some questions on, on concerns on Binance. I'll, uh, Rafi, since you love BNB and Binance so much, I'm going to give this over to you. Uh, I don't think it'd be fair to give it to Hassan, given that he's uh, a competitor of Binance. Uh, can you share your opinion about um, is there something shady happening with Binance? Breakdown of $2 billion audit uh, transaction in UTXO. I, I actually haven't read that story, so... Maybe you have some insight. Yeah, so so I think I think what happened a couple of weeks back that obviously everyone was completely shake, shaky around it. So Binance first announced that they are going to share some proof of address and all. And then there was this $2 billion transaction equivalent in Bitcoin. They, it moved, right? And there was like 1,000 messages everywhere that, oh, you know, like Binance is moving money out. So immediately after, I think half an hour, 20 minutes after that, CZ himself, you know, tweeted that, you know, did a tweet that uh, it's it's a it's a it's an audit requirement, and he even mentioned um, that one more will happen, and I think that happened as well. That the auditor apparently asked them to prove the funds uh, as part of the document that they release later on. And also, that's actually, what? That's yeah, actually a good. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, I was saying that's actually a good thing, right? It's uh, what yeah, actually technically, saying. yes, technically, I, I in in my understanding, it 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 should be a good thing. And, and then he even also mentioned about the new addresses. The thing is that it's not a new thing. If you, if you look at the past, uh, Binance has been doing this thing that, you know, they keep the cold wallets addresses public, right? So everyone can go and see that how many assets is there. Now, again, there's no guarantee that if something happens that they will return this asset, it's uh, still under their control, but it's still out there for everyone to see that there are, there are public addresses. You can go and see. I think the total worth of $70 billion of assets out there uh, to be seen. A very good majority is also in BNB, which is again their own coin, but there is BUSD as well as Bitcoin. I mean, uh, I'm not a very um, big fan of what centralized environment is, but again, I think if, if I have to pick a couple of players right now in the centralized world where we can trust, I think we don't have an option but to trust uh, you know, these guys, because if, if God forbid something happens to them or some other large player, then I think we, you know, like the crypto story can look very, very bad. But I personally, I don't think there is uh, something particularly shady happening there. There is one particular reason that I say that, as as Shaman mentioned, you know, like Alameda and FTX were closely knitted. You know, you don't hear these stories about Binance. Like you don't hear, at least, mm -hmm. at least on the front of it, you don't, you don't hear about um, a large market maker associated with them like that. You know, you, you don't hear uh, BNB being collateralized by them to borrow. At least, I've personally never seen such thing. Maybe if someone else has have, have some view on this. On this, please feel free to share. Hasn't you want to comment on that a little bit on the audit requirements? Um, that is that a good thing or a bad thing? Um, yeah. So, so we're so, not concerned. Yeah. About, right? Yeah, so, so actually, ironically, for, for this specific one, right, the, the finance move, actually, our, our CISO uh, tweeted out that this is actually not that unusual, um, and it's in high, entirely likely that an auditor actually would, could have asked Binance to do that, um, because 
they don't want to do custom processes. Many of the blockchains don't have like expressibility of like, you know, being able to use um, signatures to, to prove, um, prove ownership. Um, so, so, so yeah, ironically, actually the, this specific one, even, even, you know, Coinbase was, was like, actually it's, it's legit. So uh, it's likely legit. Um, I think just generally, like I said before, I, I think audits, uh, audits from like, uh, reputable, uh, auditors and, and companies is, is a good thing and, and, you know, should be done. Uh, the, the challenge has been historically that even like, like, for example, like the big four, it's. I'm sure there's some big four folks on the on the call today, but they've been quite challenging to deal with. Um, just because it's it's a very kind of obtuse asset class, that there's a lot of education required. And in order to do any kind of assurance, you actually have to have like a whole framework in place, and it it can get really heavy. And it can, even the cost of like actually getting it done for smaller uh, virtual asset service providers it can be sometimes um, just too much. So so I'm hoping that it, with unified standards, like even kind of you know a second tier um, or, or kind of you know long big four assurance providers can, can also, you know, play a role. Um, but I do think that audits uh, are on balance a good thing for the space, especially given the kind of trust deficit that we're facing right now. Absolutely. I would uh, just, this... I would just yeah. like to, I would just like to add that, um, you know, we can't stress enough the need for education and the need for an understanding. So whether it's an auditor or the big four or even the regulator, there is a need to come into this with a very open mind. If, if the only anecdote or if the only thing that you want to protect is the retail investor, you know, th there's, there's very difficult to have a intelligent, mature conversation about this. There is stuff that is understood and needs to be addressed quickly. And there is stuff that's still being understood. So you should be, you know, so that you're not shut off from that uh, educational process. You need to be a part of that. Absolutely. So the, the next question is uh, one of my favorite topics. I tend to fall on the side that crypto is not going to be used for day-to-day -day stuff. It's more of an investment or a store of value. So somebody's asking, and I'll, I'll give my two cents on this, uh, and I'll let everyone give their, their two cents on this. Uh, when do you think crypto could become mainstream and be part of the day-to-day -day, uh, day purchases? Um, as in, I could uh, tap my phone and pay via crypto for my groceries to purchase big ticket items. So I'm I'm more in the camp that I think crypto is an asset class here to stay. I think I look at Ethereum and uh, you know its iterations as an operating system on which things like the repo market and a lot of uh, financial um, markets will shift uh, on top of. And obviously there's competitors there. Bitcoin I look at as more digital gold and a hard asset in a virtual world, uh, which kind of takes that place of the settlement uh, component as a last resort. Um, but I do think that when it comes to money, um, the sovereigns have a pretty powerful tool at their disposal, which is they can force you to pay taxes in uh, a particular digital currency that they like. So let's say it's the digital rupee or the digital dollar. So I'm in the camp that I think from a day-to-day -day perspective, uh, because cryptos generally will go up in value on a long-term horizon, people will be less apt to spend them. And you'd be spending something like a central bank digital currency if that ever comes about. But I would love to get your respective takes on this um, as well. So we'll start with uh, uh, with Rafi and then go around. Sure. So I, I'm like more more in your camp as well. Why would you want to actually use cryptocurrency always for your payments unless you need cash? Like I mean, from from flexibility perspective, I think there are already I think uh, there are a lot of crypto cards out there. Uh, Crypto.com has one. FTX had one. Obviously, it's not there anymore. Uh, Binance has a card. Um, you there are there are some um, uh, websites where shopping IO is there. So I think in in few jurisdictions it is, it is becoming uh, a bit of a habit. Like in fact, uh, in in some of the countries when 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 we travel, uh, we can pay via some exchange apps directly. You know. So so I mean, if if you actually want to do it, there is there is a way around it. Um, and I, I I personally think that crypto needs to not only focus on being a payment provider, you know, yeah, from cross jurisdiction perspective, the transfers and everything, it's it's very interesting. Like, you know, someone sitting in Africa or like sitting in even in Pakistan or somewhere where, where movement of the Forex is very difficult. Uh, that is interesting. But like from the payment perspective, I personally don't find it supremely attractive. And I think there are still options out there, but I would rather hold cryptos instead of paying in them. 
Yeah, it's like trying to pay with pay for coffee with an ounce of gold, right? It, uh, I mean, <laughs> it looks to me, uh, or with my stock, uh, or with a, you know my Apple stock, or your stock, or your Apple stock, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I, I think. Uh, yeah, I mean, if, if you're just going around in 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 that circle, yeah, I would absolutely agree. So, so I think if you, this question was posed to me, um, you know, my answers would be number one, I don't know, because I don't know if that's the best use of this. Um, you know, it's still being, it still remains to be seen what the best use of this is. Um, uh, two, um, you know, I would firmly be in your camp. I mean, I, you know, even for a minute or two minutes, whether it's uh, at Starbucks or buying a house or whatever, um, you know, I, I don't want to risk losing the one asset who I, that I think will have more value later from a time value perspective. I, I basically choose to pay in the currency or in the asset that's, you know, uh, that's uh, you know tautologically supposed to lose value on an ongoing basis. So I, I'd use that, and I guess uh, you know uh, you know finally it, it's this thing uh, which makes sense. You know, you should always have the back uh, at the back of your mind what the utility of it is. I think it's too early, even though it's been ten years. It's too early to figure out exactly what the utility is because it's not one utility. It's going to be many many utilities. You know, it's like saying what's the value of TCP/IP. Um, you know, the protocol. You know, you had the internet and then you had the search engine. No one in 99 or 2001 thought that we'd be doing this because of what we had then. So I, I think we're very early on. And by by saying that, uh, you know, you can use it for payments is like, um, you, you know, saying you have a tank and, uh, you know, you, you, you can dry your uh, wet laundry on it. Agreed. I'm, I'm probably in the camp there. Hasan? Uh, so, uh, I, that, that was just a great visual. Uh, so I, I read that question a little differently, right? So I, I think when I think about pay via crypto, I actually include stable coins in it too. And I think that stable coins are probably one of the biggest use cases that are going on in, in uh, crypto right now. So it was about like 200 billion plus at, you know, earlier in the year and roughly like the market cap for USD stable coins is about like 90-ish yeah, right now. And, uh, and, and, uh, so, so I think st stable coins are proving themselves to actually really highlight like what are kind of the underlying you know uses of blockchains because they're abstracting or taking away the volatility because you want to be able to pay for goods and services you know with um, uh, in in the unit of account that they're denominated and so I I think that uh, I what I what I'd love to see more and what I'm expecting now is that all the non USD kind of currencies and FX are going to start getting tokenized as well. So we have uh, EURC from, from Circle um, that sort of came online a few earlier this year. Um, Singapore has XSGD, which is getting good traction. Um, so I do think that the entire kind of FX market, um, you know, or at least the major currencies uh, will probably start coming online in the next couple of years. I think that the second part of this question of when does it become mainstream and more accessible? So that, you know, there's some of it around the infrastructure side that like, you know, L1s, L2s have to become more performant and, you know, the gas fees or even things like gasless transactions have to, have to become more, um, uh, you know, as a mainstay. But I also think that like uh, wallets are becoming more and more important as kind of the, the ethos and like the trend of where this is going of how do you manage bearer assets. And one specific, um, you know, cool thing that's going on is, is sort of the use of MPC technology for semi-custodial wallets. So the biggest problem with self-custodial wallets like a MetaMask or a Coinbase wallet is generating the seed phrase and then managing it. But with this concept of like this, you know, Goldilocks solution of like semi-custodial, you don't have to manage your, your seed phrase if you don't want to. Uh, so you can just use your, you know, wallet with your assets for DeFi and like, you know, remittances and whatever payments use cases you want to do. Um, but if you lose your, your key, uh, somebody can help you kind of restore it. And that's, that's something that Coinbase is working on a lot like, you know, folks like Fireblocks offer it as well. Um, so I'm expecting a lot of the, a combination of these things to, to kind of really help make this a reality as, as sort of is posed in the question. Well, fair enough. Um, guys, one, uh, I know we're almost out of time. So a, a parting thought and more, I'm going to ask more for, I wouldn't call it financial advice, but your pre preferable position as we are forming a bottom in crypto and we start building a position for the next cycle. Um, do we go all in on Bitcoin this cycle? Is it really gonna, there's, there's different talks on it, right? That, hey, this might be the cycle where Bitcoin decouples as inflation will temporarily come down and then pop up again. And it might be that hedge, uh, decoupled hedge. Or uh, do, we, do we go that traditional portfolio where you have Bitcoin, um, a fair, fair chunk of 35% Bitcoin, 35% Ethereum, and then you play around with the rest and a bunch of other 
uh, tokens. Uh, so we just want to want to hear your respective thoughts on how you think portfolio should be constructed. And this is not financial advice. This is just our <laughs> preferences. I mean, I'd say 45, 45, and uh, 10. Uh, 45, 45, Bitcoin, Bitcoin and yeah, Ethereum, 45 right? and Bitcoin and Ethereum and 10%, um, whatever you want. Right. Yeah, yeah interesting. Uh, I think uh, I'll have a bit more coins there uh, for sure. Uh, but I think I think it should be not in one shot. For, that's for sure. I mean, it's one thing is obviously put the money you don't need for next three years, maybe, and and you know like slightly build on it. Uh, and again, even if it goes to zero, that's a standard thing with the crypto. If your money goes to zero, you know you should be okay with it because then generally expectation is of ten x, right? So if you expect ten x, then be ready to have some risk as well. I would rather say that you know have a slightly more uh, comprehensive list maybe bitcoin ethereum obviously then you can have uh some some polygon uh some bnb and maybe a couple of other uh chains uh in there and um keep five ten percent for your funky whatever you want like you know i'm sure everyone hears time and time again about some random assets so yeah i mean if, if you're out there to make money they can be a good bet but i think you need to phase it out over three to six months period in terms of buying and have to be very, very patient about it. No, no Zignali token in there? I, I, I don't I don't talk about my own token as you know. Hassan, what's, what's your ideal uh, uh, basket? Uh, so it, 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 this is a very, uh, it depends question. So if you're a trading size, like you are Faisal, probably keep it conservative, uh, you know, probably more kind of overweight Bitcoin and Ethereum and then uh, some kind of alt. But if I were just trading for 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 being DGen, uh, I actually would just have kind of Ethereum thirty. I'd give another thirty to Alt L ones, uh, and then the rest I would just um, you know take it like even further out the risk curve. Um, I, I and again like this is around like a three year time horizon. Like expecting for crypto to come back, but um, I, I just but this is also just personally I just have a lot more risk tolerance for for it. So that's why I'm saying that. And then in reverse, I'll start with you again, then we'll go back again. Last last thing, when do you, because I'm sure people are more interested in this than all the regulation boring stuff. Um, <laughs> we'll have a peak again after the next halving in, what is it, May 2024? And then the lag effect, I think, is usually about a year. That's how the historical cycles have played out, right? Uh, do you think that's going to still happen sometime in 2025? Or is it possibly been delayed based on both the macros at the Fed uh, rate hikes, as well as what's played out in crypto? So Hassan, I'll start with you. Yeah, and I think I'll, uh, I'll, I'll cycle back to maybe what I first said, right? Like if you look at the fundamentals around like what's happening kind of on the builder side of things, uh, the level of excitement is still as as high. There's more developers coming into to the crypto ecosystem um, even as, as before. And uh, people are just working on like just fun stuff, right? Like the kind of composability that you have in this open ecosystem is, is really like, it's like nothing else that you've seen in financial services before. So, so things like, you know, decentralized social media, decentralized identity, like there, there's just a lot of like, you know, fun things that, that are on the horizon um, that I do think will set us up for, for crypto, you know, to come back uh, bigger than it has before, as with other cycles. So once you have that conviction, then you can, you know, talk about like what the timing of that is going to look like. Um, before, I guess the FTX thing had happened and sort of the macro reset, the the general sentiment was like things are accelerating and things are sort of you know bouncing back faster. I, it feels very doom and gloom right now, but I'm still pretty optimistic that like once like some kind of tapering happens on on you know just the rate hikes and whatnot, like a little bit of risk comes up back into the market. It's actually be, it's actually going to be faster than like you know even waiting for the happening. Yeah. So I'm I'm pretty aggressively bullish on the whole thing. So so you're saying it could be even before. Um... Before the traditional cycle, possibly even 2024. Yeah, because we... one of my kind of in, intra crypto theses is that actually Ethereum and just the smart contract side of things is decoupling out uh, out away from Bitcoin. Um, and so while like Bitcoin will continue to be important, all the rest of this stuff uh, in terms of the use cases and build um, is going to buoy uh, crypto earlier than expected. Ethereum has been actually pretty surprisingly strong. It hasn't uh, retested uh, uh, or actually even broken the previous lows. Yeah, that's so true. So that's kind of interesting. 
Um, Rafi, your take on uh, the cycle <clears throat> eyes? Yeah, I, I actually had, uh, I again don't believe that we, the market will wait for the whole halving and the lag behind it this time around. I mean, if, if the macro environment, like especially the rate, rates, have, rates start moving back and some clarity and transparency start coming in, coming into the crypto, I think I think the movement up, upwards would be high, would be faster as well. Uh, personally, I think we might be seeing the, uh, you know, a full blown bull cycle somewhere around mid of 24, third quarter 24, I think. That's what I'm expecting. And again, there is one more reason behind it. I think the US elections, um, at that time, they would also do some things with numbers most likely. And, you know, generally markets become more bullish or at least better for the retail as like a feel good factor. So. I think the fresh money would come in around that time as well. So yeah, I think it might be earlier than what we anticipated. That's a great point. Yeah, and the Fed cut, uh, first rate cut could be some time. I know they're saying it's longer, um, but I, I I don't think, I think they buckle by June and they start cutting gradually, maybe by 25 bips uh, and then, but yeah. the markets take that so bullish, uh, especially with the celebration last night and just a rate deceleration. Um, if you look at, look at what transpired, yeah, right? slowness, slowness of the hike. Uh, Shamil, your take on this so, one. So I think I'm, I'm, I'm really not qualified to answer uh, uh, this question, but I can say a couple of things. Number one, I am, um, you know, I'm perpetually long. So uh, you know, my my view on this is going to be extremely biased. Um, I think um, I think we. So if I just ignore crypto for a second. Uh, I think from a from a risk perspective, we're still in a secular bull market. If you just look at the U.S. equity market, we've come down from cycle highs of 22 on the multiples down to 14 and a half or 15. I think uh, in the next 12 months, we go back up to sort of 19, maybe even touch 20 again. So I am extremely uh, uh, bullish from an equity perspective, and I think it's very difficult to call, um, you know, BTC or Ethereum. Um, but you know, I already gave it away by saying that 90% of my portfolio would be BTC and Ethereum. But I agree with Hassan that that is a more conservative portfolio, um, and uh, you know, it all depends on what your uh, overall size is and what you're trying to achieve with that portfolio. But yeah, I, I'm bullish. It's hard for me to say, and I think uh, I'll put, is, a, put, put a date on it. Sorry, go ahead. I'm saying that conservative conservative is still a 500% return potentially. So that's what I love about this asset class. Sure, sure. But anyways, I, I agree with Hassan and Rafi, and uh, you know, I'd just like to thank you for uh, for moderating this and for Ali and Park Launch for organizing this. Thank you so much, guys. Thanks, everyone. Really appreciate this and uh, look forward to doing this again uh, same time next year. All right. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank All you, right. everyone. Thanks for hosting. Take care. Bye. Take care. Good night.